Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Collum, and welcome to this next edition of the Human Landing Site Study Hangouts, a joint presentation by NASA's Human Exploration Operations Mission Directorate and the Science Mission Directorate here at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. Today's hydrated minerals mapping briefing builds on the conversation that started at the 2015 Human Landing Site Study Workshop uh, in Houston, Texas. But before I introduce uh, today's presenters, let's get to know our HLS2 Steering Committee co-chairs, Paul Niles and Rick Davis. Paul is a planetary scientist in NASA's Human Exploration Operations Mission Directorate at Johnson Space Center. And Paul will be sitting in today for our uh, Steering Committee co-chair, Jake Bleacher. Hi, Paul. And Rick is the Assistant Director for Science and Exploration in NASA's Science Mission Directorate on the Mars Recon Team. Uh, hi, Rick. Uh, Paul, hey, or Rick, any opening words? Paul, how about you first? Yeah, um, real, real excited to uh, hear the results of this study. Um, I think the uh, product that these, uh, this team has produced is, is really incredible. Um, it really gives a comprehensive picture of the mineralogy of the Martian surface and uh, the potential for hydration uh, and certifying hydrated minerals. So I'm really excited to hear the results. Uh, and I would just add a couple things. I totally agree with Paul. And that, um, well, first and foremost, also want to wish everyone uh, good health and their families as well with the virus situation. We also want to thank uh, Sherry Boonstra, as well as Arizona State University for hosting uh, this event. Uh, so Sherry, thank you for all you guys are doing. And then uh, thirdly, uh, you know, from the HLS2 workshop, really uh, trying to figure out the viability of these potential water feedstocks is really key. Uh, Sydney will give you an, an overview of the efforts that we've been doing across multiple mapping efforts. But it's really cool. You start to see uh, uh, really insightful things across all these different efforts that really start to point the way. So I'm really looking forward as well to hearing more. So thanks. Thank you both. Um, so let's uh, jump right in and get to know a bit more about our presenters. So today we're joined by Sydney Doe from the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Sydney is a systems engineer there and as Rick mentioned, will provide an overview of our water mapping efforts. Welcome Sydney. Hi Bob, thanks for the introduction. And we'd also like to welcome John Carter from the Institut d'Astrophysique Spéciale or the Institute for Space and Astrophysics. John is the lead project scientist for the work we'll be sharing today. He'll walk us through as team approaches this challenge and share some of the results. Hi, John. Hi. Um, and as always, we really encourage you to, to ask questions throughout the presentation. Uh, you can either drop those in the chat and we'll be reading them uh, as we're going, or you can use the raise your hand feature under the participants tab and we'll, we'll let you ask your question directly. And with that, uh, let's get the charts up and jump right in. So over to you, Sydney. Okay, so pull up the charts. Be up in just a moment. You able to screen share, Hale? Yes, I'm on the web browser, so it's taking uh, an extra an extra moment. Let me share this, and then uh, put this into full screen. And you see everything. Yes, thank you very much. Um, Perfect. Yeah. So um, before we dive into John's presentation today, uh, I wanted to provide some background on the Mars water pro mapping projects uh, that we've been running uh, since 2017, uh, of which John's project is a part of. So next slide, please. Okay, so many of you know, um, a lot of the studies we've been doing over the past uh, few years here uh, at NASA have been motivated by the question of where we should land humans on Mars. And this was the question that was posed at the 2015 Human Landing Site Workshop uh, that uh, many of you might have attended and that Rick mentioned earlier. Uh, the map here shows the 47 landing sites that were proposed at that workshop. And ever since then, uh, we've been following up on the community's thoughts and recommendations that came out of that workshop. Uh, next slide, please. 
So uh, during that workshop, we asked for proposals uh, for sites that would contain what we call an exploration zone. So this is a 100 kilometer radius site with terrain suitable for landing multiple large 20 to 40 metric ton class landers, as well as uh, containing flat and stable terrain to support a habitation site. Uh, in addition, uh, we asked for locations that would contain uh, what we call resource regions of interest. So these uh, would contain one or more water resource deposits that were easily accessible and mineable by automated systems. Um, if you look on the image uh, to the bottom right here, uh, which depicts an example of an exploration zone, uh, you'll notice that in the center of that exploration zone, uh, there are two gray circles, uh, and these represent notional locations of these resource uh, regions of interest. So typically what we want these to be relatively centralized within this exploration zone, so that it's co-located um, with, uh, or, and also to reduce drive distances uh, between uh, your mining systems and uh, where you would have to transport your materials to the processing uh, facilities, the power production zone, and the landing zones where you would have your Mars Ascent vehicles waiting to be refueled by uh, the products of your ISO use, uh, system. So a key recommendation uh, coming out of that workshop uh, was for us to better characterize where water deposits are across Mars. And that's precisely what we've been working on since uh, 2016. So next slide, please. So since then, uh, we funded a total of four teams to create uh, the best possible maps of water distribution in its various forms across Mars using uh, all available orbital data sets that we could get our hands on. So specifically, uh, we funded two teams that have since combined to form one team uh, to map the distribution of subsurface water ice across Mars. So you can see this on the left side of the slide. Um, and this is the swim team or subsurface water ice mapping team of uh, Fan Putzik and Gareth Morgan at PSI. Uh, if you follow our Hangouts regularly, uh, you might recall that uh, the PIs of this project gave a a Google Hangout briefing on this uh, topic uh, last year where they discussed their ice consistency maps that they had built of the Northern Hemisphere of Mars. So uh, they're currently working on mapping the uh, Southern Hemisphere uh, of Mars and hopefully we'll hear from them uh, in the future. I think there was a uh, question or comment in the bar, uh, in the thread there to uh, close the right hand side bar of the Adobe PowerPoint if you could just increase uh, the screen size, perfect. Okay, so on the right side of the chart um, are the other two teams involved in the Mars water mapping projects. Uh, these teams have been focused on mapping the distribution of hydrated minerals across Mars. So that's the other main type uh, of water feedstock that we're looking at. These two teams are that of John Carter from the Institute of uh, Space Ast and Astrophysics at uh, Paris-Saclay University. Uh, who, who we'll be hearing more from later today, as well as Frank Silos uh, of the Applied Physics Laboratory based in Maryland. So th these two teams were chosen because their work is naturally very complementary to each other, and the results will act as a cross-check on each other, and combined, uh, the results will give us much more insight into the presence of hydrated minerals than any one analysis um, alone. So next slide, please. For today's Hangout, uh, we'll be learning more about uh, the results from John's Hydrated Minerals Mapping Project. And before we dive into this talk, I just want to remind everyone that this is the first time that we've shared results on our Hydrated mapping, uh, Minerals Mapping Projects uh, with the broader community. Uh, given this, we're really interested in hearing your feedback and your ideas. So please feel free to ask your questions in the chat window and we'll make sure to get to them. So with that, I'll hand the ball over to John, uh, who will uh, give you an overview of this project. All right. Well, thanks, Ine, for the intro, and thank you all for joining today. Uh, so I'm happy to report on the work that our team has been doing on the theme of mapping water minerals at Mars in the frame of finding uh, interesting water resources. Uh, we've called this project MOCUS, uh, which means uh, a Mars Orbital Catalog for Chemical Alteration Signatures. So that basically means we're looking for minerals that contain water all over Mars to be able to constrain the reservoir of water and all other interesting elements of Mars. Uh, so our team comprises uh, a few members, uh, Francois Poulet, Lucie Rieu, Julia Alemano, and myself. 
And a lot of the work has been carried out at the Institut d'Astrophysique Spatiale in Paris Sacré University. Uh, so the goal of this presentation is to basically show you how we can go from the left image to the right image. So this left image shows you this sort of orbital view where we're taking pictures and data from orbits. And from this, we're trying to piece out uh, what's on the right, which is how much water is present in minerals at Mars and can we use this water for future exploration. So on the next slide, uh, you'll get a sort of a brief overview of how we do it, scientifically speaking. It's the principle are rather simple. Uh, we do what we use, what we call remote sensing of the Mars mineralogy. So imagine the surface of Mars, which is pretty much a dry place, but in some areas we have what we call aqueous mineral deposits. So these are called aqueous minerals, water minerals, hydrated minerals. What it means is, is pretty much the same. Uh, it's that we, are, we have minerals in some areas of Mars uh, which have water in their structure. And there are to the left, you can see that the uh, solar radiation uh, reflects over the surface of Mars and interacts specifically with the water in those uh, occasional Martian mineral deposits that we find. And if you go to the next slide, uh, you can see that this, this light, which is reflected from the surface, can be detected from orbit. And to do this, uh, we're using two types of instruments, which we call imaging spectrometers. The first one is called OMEGA, and it's on board the Mars Express probe from uh, ESA, the European Space Agency. And the second instrument is called CRISM, and it's on board uh, MRO, which is a uh, NASA mission, obviously. And these two instruments are rather similar and work in a very complementary way. Uh, and the type of data that you get out of these uh, instruments is uh, the kind of stuff that I'm showing you to the right. So these are a collection of spectra. So these are the reflected sunlight of the surface of Mars, which we can study in the range called the near infrared. So it ranges, that's the horizontal axis, between basically one and 2.6 uh, micrometers. And what this graph is showing you are different set of spectra of different color, and each color corresponds to a different type of aqueous mineral that we found at the surface of Mars. Uh, you see differences in these color spectra. Uh, you see that we have lots of little wiggly lines and some are uh, very sharp, some have different shapes, some have a different positions and some are numerous and other spectra have very few lines. Uh, this tells us that specifically we are able to identify different types and nature of aqueous minerals of Mars by looking at these uh, specific lines. And so these are actual data from the surface of Mars which we recovered from the orbits. Going to the next slide, uh, what we do now to identify the mineralogy of the surface is that we compare the spectra with spectra that we take from uh, samples that we collect on Earth. So these are analog spectra of minerals which we know very well from our work on Earth and which we, we can compare to uh, the data that we get from Mars. Uh, the color code here is meant to correspond to good matches that we found between our our terrestrial spectra of minerals and the Mars spectra. So by comparing spectral signatures, chiefly that's how you're able to identify the different types of aqueous or water minerals which are uh, at the surface of Mars. So next slide, please. Going forward, what can orbital near-infrared spectroscopy tell us? Well, uh, it can basically identify and map out tens of different types of aqueous minerals at Mars. The most common ones are typically what we call clay or clay-like minerals or phyllosilicates. We can also identify sulfur salts. We can identify carbonate salts and different types of hydrated silica. These are sort of the main groups and families of aqueous minerals you, you can identify. To the, to the right is an example of the typical data product that you can do science or engineering on. Uh, this is a small area of Mars, which is about 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer. And uh, it shows you the surface and the, the topography in 3D of, of Mars. And overprinted on this uh, surface, we've added a, a layer of color. And these different colors correspond to the location of different aqueous minerals. The same color code is used as the list to the left. And it's telling us that different units at the surface here have different minerals. And that tells us a lot of information about resources, about geology, etc. Uh, and I want to point out at this point that we've been doing this, the community behind these two instruments have been working on this for 15 years and, and it has led to a number of uh, really important discoveries that have really been 
um, a, a key factor in our better understanding of the history of the geology of Mars and especially the history of water on the early Mars. And I really want to pay tribute to these two instruments who have really been instrumental in our in bettering our understanding of Mars for, for science. Uh, what I'm showing you is just a small example of a spot, a small spot of Mars. Uh, going to the next slide, uh, what we want to do is not only do this for small areas of Mars, but we want to do it globally. And that was our, our goal. Uh, and our bargain was that we can map the entire surface of Mars globally at a high resolution. What we call high resolution is basically a few tens to a few hundreds of meters. So that's no spy satellite, but that's really decent resolution for that kind of instrumentation, even for terrestrial standards. Uh, and so we were able to potentially get the mineral names uh, all over Mars at this scale. Knowing what mineral is present is interesting in its own right, but that's not it. We want to go a little further. And once you know what mineral is present, you basically have an idea of the possible abundance of their constituents. So that provides you basically what the, is the major chemical makeup of your aqueous mineral deposit. Is it rich in iron? Is it rich in aluminum, magnesium, and other elements? So that's already interesting information for resources. And the second point, which is probably more relevant to the discussion today, is that we can also have, knowing the mineralogy, a qualitative indication of how the water is bound to the mineral. We know that water is in there. We don't always know exactly how, but we have an indication that the water is present in a very tight bond to the mineral or in a very weak bound to the mineral, or uh, it can be as a form of pure H2O molecule or perhaps as the hydroxyl ion. Uh, and so we have some information already on the, the state of water which is stored within these minerals. Going to the next slide. Uh, here comes in our project, the MOCAS project. It's basically a, a 10 year endeavor uh, that we started out to map all the types of aqueous minerals globally at Mars. So this work has received support from the, the French Space Agency and recently we've had this very fruitful collaboration uh, with the joint venture with JPL and NASA which leads to this project in our presentation today. Uh, MOCAS in a few words is a uh, a very sequential approach uh, to uh, aqueous minerals at Mars. We basically have these four uh, sequences where we first try and find aqueous mineral deposits on Mars, anyway, anywhere. Then we try and characterize their nature, what group of minerals, what class, what species when we can. Then we try to qualify, quantify the mineral abundance. So we don't want to just know what mineral is present, we want to know how much of that mineral is present. And finally, uh, we want to extract the actual water abundance of water within that mineral of interest. A few caveats at this point. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot about abundances for minerals or for water. However, uh, there are certain specificities of our, of our methodology, which is the fact that the abundance that we refer to, be it in volume percent or in weight percent, uh, refers to the abundance within the very thin skin uh, at the very top of the surface of Mars which is basically located within the first millimeter of the surface or even less. So it is not a, a, a bulk volume abundance like you would get from industry studying a mineral deposit on Earth. We're not able to do this from uh, Mars orbit. Uh, and we have also a second limitation is that we are able to derive mineral and water abundance for a number of types of minerals at Mars, uh, especially clays and some oxides and carbonates, but we're not yet able to uh, precisely derive the abundance for sulfate salts, which are known to be abundant and contain water and are a very strong contender for a resource uh, at Mars. And this is something we're working on. Going to the next slide. A uh, quick question, John. What yeah. kind of instrumentation would we need? Is it just a matter of being on the ground or is there something more specific that we would yes. have to land? You would have to land. If you really want to get a, a good, um, let's say a good estimate of the volume of your deposit for, as you would with the industry for industrial applications. So you wanna know a precise indication of your volume and your abundance. There is no really way to do it without landing there. You could, we could send new instruments, uh, specifically instruments that work in other wavelengths with different techniques that could provide us with some information of what's happening under the first few meters of the surface. So that's possible. Uh, these are, difficult instruments to build at high special spatial resolution. But typically, un until you land there, you won't get a very accurate reading of the, the 3D 
distribution of your aqueous mineral deposits. And if the instruments we've sent previously on our rovers and landers, have they been equipped to do this kind of uh, research or is it something that we've yet to send? Sadly, not really, because you, you need to drill, basically. It's, it's, it's about drilling or it's about accessing uh, the flanks of deposits that are, that are outcropping. So that means that they're, they're, they're visible from, from outside. They've been, they've been naturally carved into by craters or erosional scarp. And to do this, you need either a rover that can go up very steep uh, hills or very, very difficult scarps, which is too dangerous, or you need a rover with a very thick, uh, very, a very uh, deep drill to be able to make core samples. And so this is technically very challenging. Little by little, we're, we're getting better at this. And, and each new generation of rover is, is getting better at drilling and at accessing difficult terrains, but we're not quite there yet in terms of, of rovers uh, for, for 3D mapping of, of geologic uh, units like this. Uh, thank you very much. Please continue. And so actually this, this moves us, brings us to the, the, the two slides I want to discuss about limitations to our methodology. So before I show you the results uh, of our work, uh, there are two things I want to mention. Uh, the first limitation it relates to this, the fact that we're only able to penetrate the first few millimeters of the surface. That means that any other deposit of a few millimeters that co comes on top of our aqueous mineral deposit is enough to obscure our signature. So be it a thin layer of dust or a thin layer of ice or frost that deposits on top of our surface, that is enough to obscure our signatures of aqueous minerals. Also, um, from our study collectively now since 15 years ago, we know now that uh, most aqueous minerals on Mars formed very early on in its history, so over 3.5 billion years ago mainly. That means that even if Mars hasn't been super geologically active, it's still been quite active for the past three or so billion years. And so you've had a lot of geologic processes subsequent to the aqueous terrains, which have obscured the deposit by depositing new units of different nature on top of these old terrains. And, and all of this, put together translate into the fact that there's only a small fraction, less than 50% of the surface, which is really accessible to remote sensing in terms of looking for aqueous minerals. And this is the map that you're seeing here, where I've blacked out all the areas which are obscured by dust, ice, frost, or younger capping units, which means that now we're restricted to the ancient surface, which is uh, mostly this large equatorial strip towards the, the southern highlands, and it's only a, a small fraction of the entire surface of, of Mars. Going to the next slide is our second set of limitations, uh, where we are able to um, identify sometimes very precisely the mineral which is present at the surface, uh, but it's very hard to find, uh, to piece out how the mineral is assembled into its host rock. So minerals are assembled into rocks, and the rock gives us the texture, it gives us the hardness, it gives us all these other uh, mechanical properties. I want to show you here an extreme example of uh, what I'm, of what I'm uh, hinting at. Here are two images. This is the same type of mineral. It's a clay mineral like we're finding in many places at Mars. To the left is basically just dry mud. It's very brittle. You can powderize it with your hands. Very easy to, to, to exploit. To the right is sedimentary clay. It's called a mudstone. It's been compacted, it's been heated by, the, by geology for millions of years. And this is hard rock. This is much harder to extract and it's, it's, it's much more expensive in terms of resources to extract the mineral and perhaps the water within that. Uh, so it's very hard for us to, to uh, yet provide insight into how hard or how difficult it's gonna be to extract a mineral because we don't really know how the, the, the mineral is hosted uh, in terms of rock hardness and texture. Uh, next slide is our final set of limitation is even if we are able to identify what mineral is present, to quantify how much of that mineral is present, looping back to your comment earlier, uh, is, is really, really tricky. First, we have no active means to probe the thickness uh, to get a mineral deposit volume. So you would want to have this and you really need to land if you want to have accurate readings for this. Uh, and secondly, um, you can sometimes uh, get an idea of how thick your deposit is, but for this you need two things. You need the high resolution topographic data, which we don't always have. In most cases we don't have it. And you need rare erosional windows. So you need to have 
your unit which is outcropping because it's been eroded or impacting. You need to look at its flank to be able to see how thick it is. And this is super rare. Uh, so that's the first issue. No, very difficult to get the volume assessment of your, of your aqueous deposit. And the last part, it's something we're gonna talk about in a few minutes, is that even if you could uh, retrieve the volume, if you wanna know exactly how much of the mineral is, the way we do it is we retrieve the superficial, superficial abundance, which I mentioned earlier, of the minerals, but this is not trivial at all. It relies on very complex models and laboratory measurements, uh, which I'll talk uh, about in a few minutes, which have some uncertainties um, and require a lot of work. So this is not trivial at all. So I know that I'm painting a, maybe a sort of a gloomy picture of, of, uh, of this, this field, but I really wanna now show you that there is hope and we're really making a lot of headway in the direction of trying to overcome these limitations. And there's still a lot of things that we can say and that we can, we can extract from the surface of Mars from orbit and that we can use for future science and future uh, landing site planning for human exploration. So that brings us back to uh, the next slide. Uh, we uh, do have a quick question in the chat from uh -huh. Sorab and uh, maybe Rick or Paul, you might have uh, some comments on this as well. If ice or frost is obscuring the surface, wouldn't that actually be helpful for ISRU, um, even though some of the minerals underlying it are obscured? Uh, so I'll, I'll start and see what Paul has to add. The bottom line is it's not gonna give you, we're talking metric tons of water is needed that won't give it to you. Um, so it's either you're using these hydrated minerals that John's talking about, understanding those feedstocks, or you're using subsurface ice, which was basically insulated by the regolith above. And it, those are pretty pure ice water deposits that are very large. So it, those are really, in general, the two feedstocks, if you will, that we're looking at um, and uh, understanding that. Uh, it's a great, it's a cool question, but I, it's not really probably uh, relevant in terms of providing that much water th in terms of what we need. Paul, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I would just, I mean, I think John mostly referring to, to the polar process of the ice, I mean, um, but I'll let him continue. Okay, all right, thanks. Right, yeah, so this, this, uh, this sadly would probably not be a sufficient source of, of water. Um, so going back to the, to the results of our um, project, no. Sorry, one other, oh, maybe this is something ahead. you can touch on in your results, a, a question from George Lourdes, um, a, asking about how regionalized are the, the different types of hydrated minerals, or is it likely to find all the types that you characterized at the beginning in a given site? And I think you'll show some of that in your next couple of slides, but maybe if you could specifically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are, let me, yeah, uh, let me come back to this in one slide, basically. I'll add a point on this in a slide. You'll see that the, it's, the answer is not easy. There are, there are two sides to the, to the coin, but um, we have, yeah, I'll get back to this in a sec. That's a good question. Uh, so I wanna stress that uh, before going into these deep, the details of our results, that we're really able to, um, now we have this global view of Mars, such as this map that I'm showing you, which I'll detail in a sec. Uh, this is a global map of Mars, which is showing you in color coding uh, the, the location of different types of aqueous minerals. So wherever you have color on this map is where you have water or aqueous minerals. So, but that's at a very global scale. So that's convenient once, when you want to do reconnaissance mapping of the entire planet. But it's not useful, particularly useful to do detailed planning of a landing site of the sea's potential. So going to the next slide. Uh, if you take a region of Mars and you zoom in many times, uh, you can get that kind of map. We are able to produce very high resolution maps for some areas of interest. And this is a particular area, which many of you might know of, uh, obviously, because this is the, the bottom of Jezero Crater, which is the uh, landing site for Mars 2020. You can see the landing ellipse uh, up just off the delta. And this high resolution map uh, from the, our database uh, it gives you the precise location of the different resources in terms of different types of aqueous minerals. Uh, again, color-coded uh, here on top of our uh, background, which is Mars in perspective. Uh, you're seeing, for example, that the orange goo is mostly uh, magnesium carbonates and brucites and oxides. You can see a lot of uh, red blobs, which are the presence of iron and magnesium uh, water-rich clays. And then you see a more restricted areas where you have this uh, blue unit, which is aluminous clays called kaolins, and then you have sulfate salts. 
So we already have now this ability to look at all scales from the very global scale to the regional and even local scale of landing sites to uh, try and infer the potential of a given site to have interesting resources. Uh, and, and going back to the question just, just before, uh, here is an example that at the local scale, you're, you're seeing at least four different types or five different types of aqueous minerals. And that is quite true for many, many places at Mars. It's not true everywhere. There are regions of Mars where you have very, almost a bit of a dull mineralogy where you have this one or one or two types of aqueous minerals, which is always the same, which is very interesting to study, but it's very homogeneous. And you have other areas such as this one and other candidate landing sites, which are very diverse in their mineralogy, which obviously presents uh, some really good um, uh, aspects uh, to, for, for future study and resources. Um, so, and John, just to make it clear, though, you this is a spectrometer, or, or that that is measuring this. So, could talk about the depth of what you're seeing a little bit more, if you would, please, because um, you, as I understand it, you're only going down microns down. You're not going meters down, so you don't really know the density of the material. You just know that it's there, correct? Yeah, this is a surficial uh, detection or surficial abundance, which I'll show you in mm -hmm. a sec. Uh, and so we're, we know that this unit is outcropping. It could be that it's a very thin lag deposit. It's really very unlikely in most cases at Mars. From our experience, if you only had a very thin crust or a very thin layer, it would be very, uh, something very dusty that just deposits. You would see it uh, you know, forming dunes or you would see it, depending on the material, uh, you would see it not correlate very well to the morphology here where on Mars in general for aqueous minerals, you can see that these correlate to morphologic units, uh, which, are, which are not just sand, basically. They're not lag or sand deposits. So in most cases, we don't anticipate that these deposits will be very thin. For a number of cases, which I mentioned earlier, we are able to have an idea of the thickness. So we have been able in some areas of Mars uh, to uh, infer that some uh, aqueous mineral deposits are several meters, several tens of meters, and in some cases, several hundreds of meters thick. So we, we can, in some cases, measure the thickness, and we have measured extremely high thicknesses of hundreds of meters for some of these deposits. So we do have access to the stratigraphy in some places, uh, and we know that sometimes these are very thick, but we cannot say that for any deposit that and we see. Fair. And just, be, just because we have a pretty diverse community, when you say geomorphological, you, you mean like a feature, like a river delta that sort of tells you, for example, just to, yeah, exactly. that that's yeah, what yeah. water ran there. And so that's when you see the hydrated minerals plus the uh, physical uh, ID location and what the nature of that probably was. That's how you arrive at those that kind of a statement. And there are lots of those geomorphological features, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. To do the, I mean, if you want to, if you want to better understand the origin of your, of the geology of your of your aqueous unit, you have to correlate the mineralogy with the shapes, basically, of the surface. So with the morphology. Here's an example. Okay. You can see just on the center of this image is the delta. So the delta is a ponding feature on Earth and probably also for Mars. And you're seeing a, a clay distribution, uh, this red stuff within the delta, which probably means that the clay was remobilized and, and was deposited in the lake itself. There are always several theories going around, and there are many different ways to form or, or transform or remobilize aqueous minerals at Mars. This is something many people work on. Uh, but you, you're, we are usually able to understand some of these correlations between the, the shape, the morphology, and, and the mineralogy which usually le leads us to believe that these are not just sandy deposits or, or dunes or just very thin lag deposits. We usually have a good idea that these are things that are outcropping and that they're not that thin. We just cannot accurately figure how thick they are. Uh, before we move on, a great question from Roy in the chat. By when we're coloring an outcrop with a specific mineral, these oranges and reds, does that mean that we think that rock is made out of the mineral or just that it is the most abundant mineral in that rock? Does it say anything about the composition? It says if you're the way we're color coding here is just a way to, to make it so that it's uh, readable by a human eye. We basically generate maps which don't have a color coding that we decide that color code later. But we have maps that, that tell us how abundant or how 
strong an absorption feature is. So it, it's basically telling you how it's a proxy to how much uh, a mineral, how, how present the mineral is, but it's, it's not that trivial. It's not because you have a very strong mineral signatures that, that the mineral is, is extremely abundant. It's usually the case, but it's not always the case. So that's why there's a, a, a lot of work to go from these kinds of maps that I'm showing you, that I've shown you until now, to the next few maps that I'll show you soon, which are abundance maps, in which we're, we're not just looking at what's the dominant spectral signature, what's the dominant mineral, but we're trying to see quantitatively what's the proportion of each mineral for every pixel in color here on this map. And that, that's the tricky part, actually, which I'll get to in a sec. Thank you very much. Keep going. All right. So uh, next slide, please. So this is my only uh, sort of technical uh, slide, so please bear with me. Uh, I'll try and, and keep it uh, brief. Uh, so these are for people who are sort of more uh, savvy with, with uh, the mineral mineralogy and spectroscopy of Mars. Let's, let's, let's just uh, sort of break it down into five main steps uh, and, and go through it slowly. Uh, first, to, to get from the data from Omega and CRISM, which are the, the are these orbital spectrometers, to, uh, to our final data products that we can do science and panning with, we have to first tune in to the specific mineral absorption bands in the infrared using the two instruments that I mentioned. Uh, and then we implement what we call a scouting algorithm that looks for the most probable aqueous mineral signatures globally at Mars. So we are, we are looking at all the data sets, the complete data sets of these instruments, and we're looking for areas where it's most likely given the spectral signatures that there are these aqueous minerals present. Now comes the third step, which is the most, uh, let's say, painful and time-consuming step of the project, which took us many years, uh, which is to have this systematic human supervision. What happens is that we verify each candidate aqueous mineral deposit, which was so identified uh, in the previous steps, globally, uh, and we, we confirm or infirm that these are indeed aqueous minerals and what type of aqueous minerals they are. So that's to our mind, that, that's the only way that you can get no false positive and a very high detection sensitivity. It's the most reliable approach once you have trained workers doing this, this, this type of work, uh, even if perhaps in the future we could improve uh, our, our, our algorithms. Uh, that basically all these three points translate to the image that's on the lower left of your slide here, which is called identification and mapping. So doing these three first steps provides you with these kinds of maps. So here's just an example, a small spot of Mars, where you have these small uh, red squares, which are called regions of interest, because in, within these, we have discovered detected aqueous minerals. In this instance, these are clay minerals. Uh, and so a lot of work leads to having these distribution, these maps at the global scale um, of aqueous mineral locations. Now comes the part where you do the modeling to go from just finding out what mineral is present to finding out how much of that mineral is present. So this is step four. We basically perform radiative transfer modeling. We use the Shkurata theory on the largest of these aqueous mineral deposits and we derive the model abundance of the rocks. That means that we're deriving the abundance of each mineral within the rock. Uh, this works for, as I mentioned, every mineral except for sulfid salts for now. And I want to pay tribute to one of our team members, Lucy Rear, who did this work, and which is extremely intensive to, to perform. You have to calibrate the model, validate the model, repeat this iteratively many, many, many times to get things working and to be satisfied with the results of this model. Uh, this is uh, illustrated using the central images uh, on this slide. To the left is the spectra uh, of Mars. Uh, so this is called spectra extraction and spectral modeling. The black spectra is uh, the Mars surface spectrum. It's just an example from this region using the CRISM instrument. And to this spectrum, we've adjusted our spectral modeling. Uh, that's the red curve that you're seeing. And that red curve, once you're satisfied with the fit to the data, it's providing you with the model abundances, which are the pie chart to the right. This pie chart is the result of the model. It's telling you that we have found a number of different minerals within that pixel of our spectra. Uh, a few of these are what we call anhydrous minerals. So these are minerals that do not contain water in them. And that's the part that's orange or brown. So let's just remove these for now. 
And the second part is what we're interested in. This is the aqueous minerals part uh, of, the, of the contents of this pixel. It's showing us in this example that there are at least five different aqueous minerals. There are oxides and different clay minerals. Uh, the names are, are listed here. And each of these uh, minerals have a certain amount of water in them. And by summing up the water content of each of these aqueous minerals, we're able to go to step five, which is to deduce from these modal abundances the major chemical and water elements that are present within this pixel. So this, uh, this is the final sort of step of our, of our work, where for the, the pixel from the left, we're able to model, extract the modal abundances of the different minerals, and finally extract the, the water abundance here it's 4.3 weight percent for this given uh, example. So this is the full flow of our, of, our, um, of our project to go from detection to uh, water abundances. Um, how do we know the water content of the different aqueous minerals without accessing them? So this is thanks to uh, work that's been done uh, on Earth. Uh, we have the same is it applies for when we're trying to identify the, a specific mineral at Mars. We have to compare with spectra of minerals that we measure in our labs on Earth. Uh, and, and basically we go fishing for many types of different minerals on Earth. We look at their spectra, we look at their composition, we look at their water content. And so we know that any specific mineral we find has a specific amount of water, iron, magnesium, aluminum, etc. Obviously, there are small uncertainties, but uh, we have uh, an idea that each mineral detected has a specific amount of water. And that is how we can translate from an abundance of minerals to an abundance of water in the end. Next slide, please. <laughs> All right, so now let's, let's look at the, 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 the main results of our work. Uh, I've sort of showed you the limitations, the type of data we can produce, and now let's look at the, the data itself. Uh, this, I just want to give you a point of comparison. When we started the work, the state of the art at the inception was a number of global works that collectively we had carried out uh, in, in about 10 years ago. Th these were really pioneering uh, global studies of aqueous minerals at Mars. We had basically found uh, maybe a thousand sites at Mars where we had found aqueous minerals. Uh, this is shown on this map, which is a sort of compiled from a meta-analysis at the time. And every uh, red blob on this map shows you the location of uh, aqueous minerals. No details maps had been built at the global scale and we had really limited knowledge of their spatial extent and composition for many cases. So after 10 years of mapping, we are going from this map to the next map on the next slide which is uh, our current results. Uh, so the main difference that you can see, maybe perhaps already at this scale, is that there are more areas where we have aqueous minerals. The second thing you can notice is that now we have a color code, which is not just the same for every aqueous mineral deposits. So that means that at the global scale, we now have a detailed uh, idea of the composition of these different minerals. So we know that, for example, in the center of this image, we have a lot of uh, red, uh, sorry, of green and, and yellowish uh, colors. That means that we are very rich in sulfate salts in this area. You can see that everywhere else we often have very strong uh, red blobs, and that means that we're rich in iron and magnesium clays, etc. Uh, I've also put a few landmarks uh, that many of you might know of uh, here, uh, such as future or, or past landing sites for Mars or areas which have been extensively studied. Uh, so after 10 years of mapping, now we're from about a few thousand sites. We have several hundreds of thousand sites which have been studied and found and analyzed. Uh, so we have like a two order of magnitude increase in our number of sites. The thing is, uh, because these sites are very old and disrupted, most of the aqueous deposits that you're seeing here are not visible at this scale. Uh, so we have to go to the next slide where I'm going to show you the same map, but a different way of showing you the data. And now you're seeing that the surface of Mars is basically lighting, lighting up with all of these aqueous mineral deposits in color. What this map, the difference between this map and the previous one is that I've colorized every pixel of, this, of the surface of Mars wherever we have aqueous minerals which have been found within a 10 by 10 kilometer region. 
why this, this size? Well, that's the typical size of a modern landing ellipse for NASA missions. So in other terms, wherever, if you want to pick a landing site within any of these areas which are in color on this map, it means that you're, you're guaranteed to find aqueous minerals within a 10 kilometers radius. So you have resources that are available within 10 kilometers. There are probably more that we cannot see from orbit, but this is sort of a, the minimum we can see uh, from orbit for now. And it's showing you that there are uh, really a lot of aqueous minerals available at Mars. Uh, and, and remember that a lot of the surface of Mars is not accessible to remote sensing because it's been mantled or capped by different processes. So going to the next slide, you're gonna see that if we blank out all the areas that are not readily accessible to uh, remote sensing from orbit like we're using, you can see a very nice correlation between the areas where we have aqueous minerals and the areas that, that are observable. Uh, and so I want to stress the fact that 15 years ago, when this community started working on this, whenever we found the aqueous minerals at Mars, we were overjoyed and we were very surprised and very excited. It was really something new and something incredible to find aqueous minerals somewhere, anywhere at Mars. The situation now is absolutely the reverse. When you're studying the surface of Mars from orbit, you're looking at the ancient surface and you have good data and you have good access to the surface not finding aqueous mineral is actually rare. It's actually something that's unexpected. And it's telling us that the ancient surface of Mars is, is literally blanketed in different types of aqueous minerals. So you can see from the diversity of color here that we have a diversity of minerals and that these minerals, some of them are present everywhere, whereas some other minerals are concentrating in specific regions. So we have areas where, which have blobs of yellow, blue, green, etc. So this is our main result in terms of the composition uh, of what mineral is present where. Now I want to finish this presentation with our results in terms of quantitative analysis of the mineralogy. Uh, so to, before we yeah. jump on to that, uh, another question from Saurabh. Uh, regarding the constraints on sulfate salts in um, point four of, of your methods, can we at least comment on the contribution of polyhydrated sulfates versus mono, monohydrated sulfates? using uh, MOCUS? So we could, yes. This is, uh, this is something we're working on, basically. Um, monohydrated sulfates are not as common as polyhydrated sulfates. Uh, so these, the monohydrated sulfates are called such because in the structure, the elementary structure of the crystal, of the mineral, you only have one molecule of water. Whereas polyhydrated, we have several. And you can have up to six, nine, even 12, uh, water molecules in the polyhydrated sulfate. So potentially uh, some salts can be 12 times more hydrated than some of the monohydrated sulfates. However, um, a lot of these mon polyhydrated sulfates that we're seeing at Mars, so everything that's green or yellow here, we don't think that they're super hydrated. It means that they could have maybe two, three, six perhaps hydrations instead of one for the monohydrated. So it's still good, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the jackpot. So there will be more water present within these sulfates than the monohydrated forms, but not necessarily uh, a completely crazy amounts of, of extra water. It also depends on how much uh, of that uh, salt is present in the rock. Is it 100% salt or is it 50% salt and 50% uninteresting dry stuff that's mixed with it? This, we don't know for sure yet. We're pretty sure that in many areas, it's almost pure salt because it's very, very strong. Uh, the signature is very strong, but this is not something we can yet, uh, you know, very accurately pinpoint. Very cool. Uh, and another question from Doug, is there a visualization of places we have looked but don't see aqueous minerals that aren't obscured by dust? Or is that how we should interpret this map? Uh, that there are no hydrated minerals um, uh, you've looked at those sites but haven't detected any, or do we need more analysis slash data? It is partly this. So this, this is half knowledge, half feeling, in the sense that we've looked at many, many thousands of data sets. And it is true that there are few areas of Mars uh, where you're not seeing aqueous minerals and you, have your, uh, and you have good data. So this could mean that either there was no hydration there or there was never any aqueous minerals there or that the mineral signature was obscured 
even very uh, early on in the history of Mars. Uh, not seeing any minerals doesn't mean it's not there. It means it's not there today at the surface uh, that we can detect from orbit. Uh, we know that our methods of detection from orbit are somewhat limited compared to what a rover can do, for example. Uh, we, we usually get very good correspondence in the, to the first order between what we see from orbit and what the rovers can see, but the rovers are always able to find a few percent of aqueous minerals in areas where we, we cannot. So uh, you have to interpret these maps as a strict lower limit to the distribution of aqueous minerals. So wherever you see color on this map, you have definitely aqueous minerals within this, the regions of interest. Uh, I mentioned, but it doesn't mean that elsewhere it's not there. In some places it could be, but in some places it could just be that we're not able to see it because they're not enough or they've been mantled by something else. My take on this from this from studying these minerals for a while now is that they were pretty much everywhere in the early surface of Mars, but you've been disrupting your surface for so long that you've had impact gardening, you've had lava flows, you've had dust and mass wasting that have been obscuring little by little uh, these aqueous deposits. But until you're there, you cannot say that for sure we're seeing, you know, we, we can't say that they're everywhere until we get there. There's no way to, be, to confirm this. We need proof, ground proof. And just a quick question of clarification from Oscar in the chat. Uh, the blackout areas on this, on the map that we're currently showing, um, just the, the reasons we haven't studied them again, I think they include ice cover, dust cover, and mantling. Are there any others that so, we should be thinking of? Yeah, these these have been studied actually. Like we we have tried we before we've known now we know that these regions are not suitable for studying the aqueous mineralogy of Mars. But we did not know that at the beginning. We were very agnostic relating to this. So we studied uh, using our data sets. Uh, we studied the entirety of Mars. But we know now that these areas are not suitable because they're they have dust, because they have ice for frost, or because they have younger geologic units which have overprinted. The ancient surface. We, we did look for, for aqueous minerals there, but uh, not expecting any, and indeed in most cases we were not finding any. Uh, we have independent means of verifying why we're not finding any. We have other instruments and other techniques that confirm that this area is very dusty, that this other area is very icy, or that this area is not suitable because it's too young. So uh, we have independent means of confirming or, or explaining why we cannot find aqueous minerals in the areas which are blacked out. Thank you very much. Uh, please keep going. All right. So, so far we've looked at the quantitative, uh, qualitative analysis, and now let's move to the quantitative part, which is the tricky part. Uh, so, next slide, please. Uh, this map will show you pretty much the same distribution of aqueous minerals that you've seen previously. Uh, however, the color code is very different. Uh, this is the first map of water and other chemical elements stored in aqueous minerals at Mars. It's the first global map of the abundance of surficial water as weight percent. It uses Omega uh, data set at one kilometer per pixel resolution um, for now. Uh, the color code goes from uh, green to yellow to uh, red, and that means from almost zero or one percent abundance of water to ten or a little over ten percent. The max you get is about thirteen or fourteen percent of, of weight percent of water uh, in some areas of Mars uh, at our resolution. And you have a second color code. The second color code is this blue uh, stuff that you're seeing towards the equator, and these are the distribution of the sulfate salts at Mars. This is where we're work, that's what we're working on to try and quantify these huge deposits which are rich in salts and hence possibly quite rich in water, possibly more rich, more rich in water than these other de deposits and perhaps more easily extractable too. Uh, and so uh, this provides you the global inventory of water and minerals, partly quantified and partly uh, to be quantified, which is the blue area. Again, this is a global map, so it doesn't give you a very nice feeling of, of what exactly or how, or how that, that, that data set it can be used for, for future work on, on Mars and, and landing sites. So the next slide is, is showing you a close-up of one of these areas. This is a very well-studied area called Mars Valleys, which has been proposed many times as a landing site and is a proposed, for, uh, a proposed landing site for, uh, for HLS2. This is one of the areas where you have perhaps the highest abundance of of water minerals at Mars, and hence the higher abundance of, of water uh, in these minerals for Mars. 
to the left is uh, a close-up of this area showing the distribution of nontronite clay. So this is an iron-rich clay that's rich in water. Uh, you can see that the, the abundance within this area range from uh, zero to about 50%, so that's huge. Uh, the, uh, this area I'm showing you is about, uh, let's say, 300 kilometers wide. And to the right is the same area, but this time looking at the total water abundance present in all the aqueous minerals which have been found in this area. So uh, we have this global map, which we can use at this resolution or even at higher resolution, which can now readily inform us on where is water mostly stored in aqueous minerals from our surficial abundance uh, analysis. Uh, and so this is something where we want to expand with the salts, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Okay, so moving to the next slide. Um, I want to mention to, to, to wrap up here uh, that there's another reservoir of water at the surface of Mars, which is not ice. Uh, and this reservoir is exemplified by this uh, map here, which one in, someone in our team uh, made a couple years ago. Basically, what I've been showing you up to now it has been using a, a specific uh, fingerprint for water, looking at absorption features in the infrared. There is, however, another uh, fingerprint for water in the spectra of these data sets, of these instruments, that is independent from those that I've shown you and have used so far. This fingerprint is, is sensitive to water molecules, which are either adsorbed or more tightly bound to, uh, to the rock. It in, pr in print aqueous minerals. So we would expect to have a distribution which is similar to the distribution of aqueous minerals which you have seen uh, until now, but it is not. You can see that this distribution globally is very different. And also we, we made sure that this is not something, we're not looking at ice or, or even water clouds that are sort of, uh, you know, blurring our signal. This is signal of the surface of Mars which contains a few weight percent of extra water if you actually look at the lower latitudes towards the equator, this is mostly the purple area, the average over these latitudes is four weight percent. So we had a map of aqueous minerals, a few weight percent of water, and now we have this other map that is showing us an, a, a bigger, a more complete distribution of up to four weight percent on average of water at low latitude, regardless of the distribution of aqueous minerals. So that's very interesting because we have water in aqueous minerals, but we also have water elsewhere. It's not always, it's mostly not correlated to our distribution of minerals. The problem is the mode of binding of this water to the regolith, so that means the top soil of Mars, is really quite unclear. Our thoughts on this source of water it's, is that it might be very superficial. It might be a, a few layers or a few molecules of water that are bound within the regolith and which are not a substantial source of, of, of water resource very much like seasonal frost, as was mentioned earlier in this talk. So we have this extra source of water present in theory, but we don't think that this is a, 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 a let's say, a, a meaningful source of a resource for a future exploration. Um, but we're continuing to study uh, these uh, together to see if there's a reason that we have this feature here for Mars. And finally, my very last two slides. Uh, one results. quick question on, on this one. Um, have we seen any indications of seasonality to this map, uh, additional? So this was our initial thought, actually, that this was something that was linked to humidity. So Mars has a very thin atmosphere, but it still has a climate, and it has a humidity cycles and a water cycle, actually, from water to gas, uh, clouds, et cetera. Uh, and we know that in the polar region, you have the seasonal effect uh, that takes place where thin layers of water are probably deposited and uh, are sublimed and, and go back to the soil. However, this is not observed, what you're seeing here is not observed to be seasonal. That's, that was the main finding at the time, which was surprising, is that this is not something that varies uh, with seasons with relative humidity. It's something that's pretty much there all the time. It, it does happen in the polar region, but it doesn't happen in, this, in these uh, areas. So some form of water remains bound to the surface of Mars in summer, in winter. There might be small variations, but it's, it's not something that we fully understand yet. And it could very well be a very superficial, superficial layer. Thank you very much. 
So now let's try and wrap up our results and think in terms of, of uh, future planning for landing sites. So the next two slides are about that. Uh, here I've taken the map of Mars and we've blanked out all the areas which are not suitable. So we've blanked out the areas which are mantle, which I mentioned and I showed you earlier. So mantle by dust, by ice, by frost, by geologic units which are younger than those in which we have found aqueous minerals. So, uh, and, but that's not it. Uh, we are also uh, removing areas which are at high latitude, so over 40 degrees. And we're also removing areas which are high altitude over one kilometer uh, altitude. Uh, and it's showing you that this map is much, much, much smaller than it used to be. Uh, if you try to focus on those area and color, if you consider that this is where, these are the areas where we could land because these are interesting for science and they're interesting for resources, then your map, because your choice becomes rather small. Uh, you're removing a lot of areas at Mars. Uh, which is good for landing site selection purposes because your choice is not infinite. And I can even go further with the next slide, which is that if you're trying to use, if you're using the stronger constraint of landing below zero kilometer, kilometers, your region of interest is even smaller. So this is telling us that if you're guided by aqueous minerals to find a, a suitable landing spot, which I think we should for many reasons, uh, and if you take into account the major engineering constraints uh, and the areas where we don't have access to the surface minerals of interest, then your choice becomes fairly limited. Uh, it still means that you have ample landing spots, but the regions in which you can find landing areas are, are way more restricted. And that's a way to sort of narrow down the, the work for future uh, studies of landing sites um, to focus on those which have the highest potential. So uh, I have a few slides of prospects that I'm not going to show you live. Uh, these are there just in case you have questions on the future of this work and how we're trying to overcome our current limitations. Uh, but obviously, feel free to um, ask any questions about what I've shown you today or uh, where we're the direction in which we're trying to move forward to overcome our, our current hurdles uh, in terms of the limitations. And with that, I'll thank you for your time and take any questions. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, we, are, we are almost at time, so maybe we have time for one or two more questions, if anyone wants to throw one in the chat real quickly. Um, all right, well, uh, without any questions, I think we will wrap up today's, oh, I would, uh, today's session for the day. Um, so uh, thank you. We'll, John, and thank you, Sydney, for, for joining us. And thank you to everyone in the audience who came out. Uh, if you have any thoughts or ideas about future topics, you can reach out to us at our um, the NASA Dash Exploration Zones uh, email address. And you can send any question, additional questions, comments, or feedback there as well. Um, Paul or Rick, any, any final words? Uh, Paul, how about you? Oh, no, great. A super interesting talk. Yeah, so the only thing I would add, say is that, uh, first of all, a big thanks to John and his team for all the work they've been doing. You guys are rocking, so that's really cool. Uh, uh, one thing I would mention about those uh, elevation constraints that he put on there, um, the NASA EDL community is moving towards a zero kilometer MOLA for these heavier human spacecraft. That's why he's got that mask in there. I will tell you SpaceX, which has even a bigger one they aspire to land on Mars, has a minus two kilometers, just to give you a sense of the, of the evolving story on that. So what the real constraint is, we don't know, but it does paint a picture of when you start mixing all these constraints, you start seeing the kind of thing uh, John is showing there, which I think is exciting. Um, and then finally, a big thanks to Jerry and ASU for hosting this. Uh, it's, this is a great platform, despite the one little glitch we had. Uh, it's an amazing platform, so thank you all very much for doing that. And uh, thanks to everyone again. Um, until we'll hope you'll be able to join us uh, for our next hangout. And until then, stay safe, everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs>